anything you've ever put into your mind about what you think touring is going to be like based on what you've seen on TV or in the movies, just put all that out of your head. There's nothing glamorous about touring, at least not on an independent level. There's not. You're going to be working really hard, you're really exhausted. You're going to be driving a whole hell of a lot. And if you really don't love what you're doing, you really don't love your music, that might be the breaking point for you. Hello, my name is Israel. I've been involved in hip hop since the 1980s as an artist, producer, radio show host, journalist, documentarian, magazine editor, hip hop advocate, and pundit. Over the years, I've interviewed hundreds of interesting people in music, media, and more. Welcome to Sounds from the Underground, the podcast from Insomniac Magazine, where we learn from both those who reside below the surface and those who've breached it. Mr. Pete Chill, how you doing? This is Israel. Hey, it's good to talk to you, buddy. I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? Good, good, man. I'm glad that you uh, were so awesome to make time on short notice. Appreciate you having me on for this, man. That's that's really cool. I've been a I've been a fan of your magazine for well over a decade now, probably two decades. And uh, it's funny. Not, it's not funny actually. My mom passed away in March, but it's. Uh, my sister and I have been cleaning out her house, and I found a box of my old things, and I found a, an old Insomniac magazine in, the, in a box of stuff there. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fresh. I'm going to save that. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Well, thank you. My condolences on your mom passing. I, I saw a picture that you posted online. At the, so that was an old picture that you were at a show, weren't you? With your mom? Yeah. Uh, is it, yeah. It was, well, my mom didn't make it out to a lot of my shows. That was a picture of her. I played at the... Uh, California State Fair. I got to, uh, for like four or five years in a row. They were ha- hired me to play the big stage once, you know, once per summer, and uh, she came out to one of those shows. And that was real cool. That's so. pretty awesome. That's phenomenal, man. Let's go ahead and get started with talking a little bit about your background in hip hop and specifically in the live space. And that's one thing that I've admired about you for so long is that I constantly see you posting tour dates and shows. And it's kind of an interesting phenomenon in hip hop that especially with more underground hip hop artists, you don't see them doing as many shows as maybe you once did. What what, what do you think about that? I think it's too bad, man, because the way I look at it, dude, is this is my art form. This is my craft. This is, you know, the equivalent to a painter. When I go perform, that's basically like me painting another piece or painting it in front of people, so to speak. And I feel like as an art form, I need to practice my craft as much as possible. And part of practicing is doing it in front of people and and sharing that energy with people because that's how you grow. I've I've found that a lot of songs, if if I haven't recorded it yet and I start doing it when I'm out on tour, when I come back and record it, or if I've recorded a demo before I leave on tour and I come back and after performing every night on tour and record it again, the energy is completely different and usually in a positive way. So I think it's part of the growth and development for all artists should be out there at least at some point doing some shows, whether it's locally or regionally or what have you. But just get out there and perform wherever you can, you know? Indeed, I definitely agree with that. So speaking of shows, if you don't mind, could you walk me through the steps of booking shows as an independent artist and even deeper than that touring (laughs) which is much more involved as an independent artist i know right now you're about to go on a how many city tour uh we are doing 22 tour stops that includes uh three radio dates as well and one private event we're performing at so we're doing 18 public events three radio shows and a private event wow and it's gonna be in the course of about four and a half weeks we're doing the whole united states wow that's incredible man so man that's one heck of a feat so talk to me a little bit about how you start prepping i would imagine that you start months in advance yeah i've done it where i've put a tour, to, like a smaller regional tour together at short notice, you know, with like maybe a month, month and a half out. And I've had some success with that, but man, that's like, that's just, if you don't like stress, don't do that, man. Cause you're just chasing everybody down, hoping that everything's going to line up. So, you know, Oh, they're available this time, you know, cause most, most venues are booking, you know, two, three, four months out in advance. And if they're not booking that far out in advance, they're going to let you know when to contact them. So I try to do, if I'm doing a full four or five week tour, I'm trying to book that at least three, four months in advance. So talk to me about how that starts. Where do you begin? I mean, obviously, there are a lot of things to do. Do you start with putting out feelers for venues? I would imagine after 20 years, you know plenty of people in the venue space. It's gotten a lot easier. There's a lot of cities that 
every time I go on tour, as long as the date's available, they're going to give me the date. And it's there, there was wonderful, wonderful folks about booking. We have great working relationships. So a lot of times if I'm like, Hey, I want to go out and I got a new record. I want to tour this record. So what I'll end up doing is, okay, look, I know I can go here, 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 and here. And let's see, in these two cities, it's better on Tuesday nights because they have a weekly you know, hip-hop event on Tuesday nights in that town, and it cracks off every time. So I'll make sure I need to be going through this city on that day. And then I kind of work the routing out for the tour. And then, of course, I reach out to the people I know, get those dates secured. And then it's like, okay, now let me look at these dates in between. That's why I try to you know, fit into some places I may have never gone to before or places that maybe I don't go to quite as often because I don't have as good of a working relationship that I think was you know, the first place that I book. So that's when I kind of start filling in those dates. And uh, a lot of that's also, you know, when I was first setting up my tour network was just reaching out and networking with other artists. Indeed, indeed. So what are some of the tools of the trade? So obviously you're reaching out to a venue. If it's someone that you don't know, are you sending them a one sheet? Obviously you have a website, you have an EPK. What is it that you're getting to them to kind of get the message that you're looking to set up a show? Well, I generally start off by emailing the venue's booking person. And in the email, I have links to the EPK and the website and all of that. But I put in the text of the email up front with them like, hey, here's what I do. This is the style of music I am. And I figure a lot of these venues, if they're not specifically catering to hip hop, they're not going to know all of the really, you know, the deep references of like, oh, he's a lot like, you know, little brother, or he's a lot like this. So they're, they're going to be like, they're going to hear bigger names and put it together. So I'll find some more, not so a mainstream, but older school mainstream artists that they might relate to and say, hey, my stuff's like this, this, and this, because they're more likely to understand what that is because a lot of people hear hip hop these days. It's, it's actually that these days it's always been like that, but they hear hip hop and immediately they're hearing what the negative media has to say about hip hop, whatever you know, mainstream media says, Oh, hip hop is bad. Hip hop is this, you know, violence, the hip hop shows and blah, blah, blah. So I just want to make it very clear that what I'm doing is not the same as what you're going to hear on the radio. that got this really bad reputation. You know what I'm saying? So, cause a lot of venues are just so afraid to book because they buy into all the BS, uh, you know, the negativity that's been pumped down their throat for God knows how long. So you've got to basically come off very clear, you know, I let them know that the positive stage show, let them know that, you know, high, you know, good energy. We have a good time. This would be a really, almost in your email, you have to write your bio, so to speak, but kind of make it sound like it's in passing conversation. One thing that I do a lot of, and I'm probably going to out myself on this, but I don't care. I'll send an email out and I'll use my real government name and say, yeah, I'm, I'm Mr. Pichos manager, blah, blah, blah. That wakes a lot of times venue booking people See, oh, he's working with a manager. Okay, well, he must be, you know, a cut above the rest. Let's give this a chance to see what the music's about. Let me look at these video links he sent me. Let me listen to these audio links. Look at the EPK, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of times, it's just a mind game. I hate to say that because these booking people, if you're just cold reaching out to a venue, you know, like a cold call to them or a cold email to them, they're getting so many of these emails. You've got to do something that's going to set yourself apart from the rest of them so they actually take the time to consider booking you. I couldn't tell you how many times I've reached out to venues to, you know, to book a date in some city I've never been to. And probably eight out of 10 times, they don't even respond with a no thank you if they're not going to even have you, you know? And, and that's frustrating. I tell, even when I don't get booked, when a booking person gets back to me, I'll be like, thank you for getting back to me. Let me know. I do appreciate the professionalism, you know? And, and a lot of times that'll spark conversations where, you know, maybe the next time around you will work with them because now you've kind of developed a little bit of rapport with these people, you know? Mm -hmm. And in regards to venues, obviously you have a range of the types of venues and obviously the capacity that you will play. How much time do you spend digging into identifying venues that make sense for a particular uh, city that you're playing? Um, I have a couple of different uh, resources I use that have information on venues. Uh, one of them that I recommend to any artist trying to begin touring is a website called IndieOnTheMove.com. They have a really, really, really well-defined, broken down by city and state for venues all across the United States, has contact information for them. And of course, in most of the venues list capacity and age limitations and things like that. And it also will say... Some of them will tell you, hey, these are the genres we don't do. So I know better to even just not even try those places. They're not going to be interested in what I'm doing, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I'm going to a new city, I usually go for a smaller venue because I figure I'm not going to pack the room out. 
And there's nothing worse than playing a great big old beautiful room mm-hmm. and having maybe 50 people show up when the capacity is 500. Whereas if I play a room, the capacity is 150 show up, man, that energy is going to feel really good that night. Mm-hmm. And it's going to show to the people and then they're going to have a better time. and They're going to remember you more in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And in regard to negotiations for compensation, I would imagine, and feel free to to correct me if I'm wrong, or if you don't want to share that, that's perfectly fine, that in some instances, there might not be an upfront guarantee. Instead, maybe you're making a piece of the door or there's some other arrangement. Absolutely. Yeah. There's every night of my tours, it's a different deal. In fact, I have a I keep a spreadsheet I take with me on the road with all the pertinent information for each day from the hotel to the drive time to all this stuff. And I list on there what our compensation is going to be. And it's different practically every night. A lot of the places that I reach out to first that, that I've gone to time and time again, yeah, I'm getting a guarantee there. We know how this works. And they're like, hey, I'm going to do this flat fee. And it's fine. Everything works out great. A lot of the places in between, I'll work out door deals or bar deals. Bar deals, actually, I really would prefer to do bar deals over door deals mm. because if you can get a venue, I had a place in Idaho I was doing shows out until they closed up where they would give me a, a 20% bar deal where I get a 20% cut of the bar every night and they charge no cover. Mm. Now, it was right in their downtown. It was in Boise. It was right downtown, college town, kids wandering in, drinking all night long. There's no cover charge to keep them from coming in and checking out the music. Mm-hmm. My merchandise did really well. And then at the end of the night, because they're drinking and drinks are cheaper there than they are in a lot of other large cities, you know, we make out like a band at the end of the night. The bar's doing great. We're doing great. The fans are great. And I think that's actually the best possible scenario. I, I prefer to not charge a cover and get a bar deal when I can, but unfortunately not everyone, you know, everyone's got their own way they do things. Sure. You kind of have to kind of roll with the punches sometimes. So. Indeed. And, Obviously, if if anyone knows anything about the music industry, one of the biggest, I would say that other than maybe record labels, the second biggest culprit for shadiness historically has been the promoter. So what would you say, (laughs) what would you say are some maybe warning signs that you're dealing with the wrong promoter or maybe just things to watch out for? If you have a promoter, when you get to the venue for sound check and they're nowhere to be found, you know, know, the sound guy might be like, oh, yeah, I'm setting your sound up, whatever. But if you have no contact with that promoter the day of the event, I mean, even even telephone contact, you might be getting shafted that night. (laughs) You know, I've had I've had where I've I've had to walk promoters to an ATM machine to get our guarantee before. I was like, this dude's like, oh, I'm just going to run down here and be right back. I said, yo, actually, really, we got to leave town now. I, I totally lied. I didn't really care. I was like, you're not going anywhere without me getting my money. So I, I was like, hey, there's an ATM over there. Why don't we, I'll just walk over here with you. I walked into the ATM and made him pull out some money and keep his end of the bargain, you know? And, and it, it sucks you have to do that because I don't like to be the, you know, the, the strong arm kind of guy. I like to be the guy that everyone likes to have a good time and have a beer with. But when it comes down to business, it's got to be a whole different set of rules, you know? Correct. And is there anything in advance before you get to the city when you're actually booking the date that would be a red flag when you're doing business with someone? Ah, red flags prior. If they start picking apart your music a little bit, like, oh, you know, we just want to keep it, you know, kind of poppy and blah, blah, blah. So do music that's a little more pop feeling. And I'd be like, mm, don't tell me what to put in my set. I'll, I'll feel that out by the room who's in there that night. I'll, I'll, I'll make that decision. I don't want someone else telling me what I'm going to bring to them when this is, I've already shown you what I have to offer, mm-hmm. you know? Also, if, uh, in a lot of cases, if it's a door deal, a lot of times I don't get it in writing. I figure if the door deal is a door deal, I mean, if it's in writing, they're just going to, if they don't want to pay me what they're going to pay me, they're just going to lie and say we didn't make that much in the door. And it's, I mean, it's not worth my time to put the paperwork together for that. But for guarantees, it's a good idea to get that in writing. If someone, if you bring it up and say, hey, I'd like to get this in writing and they don't want to do that, it's kind of a red mm-hmm, flag. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a little bit about some of the other things that go into booking a tour. Obviously, you have to have a place to stay. You need to get there. I would imagine that because it is something that you're setting up in advance, you know, logistically, the route makes sense. So in other words, you're not moving from the West Coast to the East Coast. And I'm assuming you're on wheels as opposed to flying from date to date. What goes into planning all of the logistics behind that and some of the things that you need to make sure that get taken care of before you hit the road. 
I make sure I have a place to sleep every night. I've done tours early on in my career. I'd be like, oh, I'll figure that out when I get there. I'm sure I'll find something. And it's not fun sleeping in your car. It's, it's not fun taking a bath in a gas station bathroom. You know what I'm saying? So it's better to make sure you figure it out, you know, where you're going to be resting your head at the end of the night, you know? So I'll book motels based, probably usually the shittiest motel in town, but it's like, whatever. If I'm alone, I stay in a little bit nicer places. But when I'm traveling with three or four other guys, we're like, eh, all hotels look the same when you're asleep. So what the hell, right? Save the money. Because that's the bottom line. So every time you can save a dollar on the road, you're making a dollar, you know? But yeah, so I book the hotels in advance. And I do make sure that logistically it makes sense. I try to do very, like, I call it zigzagging, where, like, I would go from, like, Phoenix to New Mexico, back to Phoenix and then back over to Texas. I mean, I'll do that sometime in like within like three or four hour drive of each other. But if it's going to be a long drive, I'm trying not to do too much of that. Cause I feel like that's just a waste of gas. And then here I am, every day I'm spending even more money out to go out and do the show. So then it's, it's cutting into the bottom line. So. So I would imagine that one of the most important parts of touring, other than playing the right places, is having merchandise available. The world of merchandise is probably the most important thing about touring because that's the one part of the money you're going to bring in as an artist that helps support you continuing to tour that you can control. I've gone into shows where either I've gotten screwed on the door or maybe didn't have that good of a deal to begin with because I was just filling in some dates between some good paying gigs. But I'll go in there and I'll do a few hundred dollars in merchandise. So it's so important to have a merchandise presence. I'm still pressing up CDs. People say, oh, CDs are done. I'm still selling, you know, a few boxes of CDs every time I go out on tour. Vinyl is super hot right now. As any artist with me can afford to press vinyl, do that. And do not even question how much it costs. You will make that back because people are buying vinyl. People that don't even really want to hear that your music will buy your vinyl because they collect records type of thing, you know? So that's a very important thing to have a t-shirt. I do pretty good on t-shirts and stuff, but you also got to have some stuff to give away to people too. Keep some, you know, stickers and buttons and whatnot out there. I did a bunch of beer cozies one time and I was doing a tour through the, the Rockies and up into Montana and stuff. And, you know, good old boys love those beer cozies. Yeah, buddy, I'll put my beer in that. <laughs> so, but, but it's cool. It, it, it's funny too, because I, I had a dude come to me in a show in New Mexico one time. He's like, he saw my beer coat. He's like, holy crap, I have that at my house. I got it. My cousin in Idaho you know, gave that to me. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. But okay, cool. Because you know, it's, it's just good to have things since. Make sure everybody goes home with something with your name on it. But keep that merchandise going strong. You've got to keep that going strong. Because that's where I make my profit. You know, if mm-hmm. I might break even on a tour from the gate and everything else. That's kind of my goal is break even from the gate or the bar, or whatever kind of arrangements we have. But if you're going to make a profit, your profit comes from uh, selling your merchandise. Right. And did you have, I would say, maybe like a really out of the box or interesting piece of merch? Yeah, I had a, in 2013, I was on tour with a couple of guys and uh, we coincided our tour at the start of baseball season. And it was called the opening day tour or something like that. And we actually had baseball cards of ourselves printed up to give away at all the shows. That's cool. The backs on it was our information and stuff. And you know, we, we designed them to look like old Topps cards from the 80s. It was pretty fresh. And everyone's like, oh, my God, you got baseball cards? I'm like, yeah, man, that's my rookie card. You better get that now. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about promotions. I would imagine that while you're in a particular city, that if it makes sense time-wise, that you're setting up some type of press. That works with the. I, I, when I'm not on the road, I run a um, digital distribution and publishing company. And uh, one of my business partners over there, who does all of our marketing and whatnot, handles that for me in advance when I go on the road. I just give him my dates, and he reaches out to local media for me and makes sure that it has it listed on their calendar grid. I've had a few cities where they'll actually call me up and I'll do an interview with, you know, leading up to the show for their, whatever their magazine or their newspaper is and things like that. And also for promoting too, it's, it's imperative when possible, reach out to the local acts that are playing here and make sure that they are promoting the shows as well. Cause unfortunately I'm not on the ground in that city for the week leading up to my normal promotion hustle. I would do say if it was here at home in Sacramento for me, but you know, to make sure these guys are on the ground, just making sure it's in people's ears, they know it's coming up, you know? 
Right. So is that something you typically do is find hip hop act that would make sense to open locally and then uh, make that connection and, and put that together? I do whenever I'm able to. Yeah. A lot of times the venues have acts that they like, oh, no, I know this guy, this guy, and this guy. We like to work with them. And I just let them, if that's what they're going to do, that's cool. And I let them do their thing. But usually if a venue has acts like that, the venue's also typically taking care of the promotions properly as they're supposed to anyway. So Nice. And in regard to radio, obviously, there are not many independent hip-hop artists that are getting played on commercial radio. However, I would imagine that college radio is still a relevant outlet. Absolutely. So tell me about that. College radio is great because the DJs basically decide their own playlist at that level. It's not like a commercial radio where it's dictated what they're going to play. Basically, if you can get a DJ to like your stuff and play your music on the radio, they'll probably play it if they're liking what they're hearing as long as, of course, it's radio playable and all of that. I've also found a lot of success, too, with community stations that aren't associated with colleges. I have a couple of different community stations that have hip-hop shows that put me on every time I come to their town. So I just let them know in advance when my tour dates are. And like, hey, you need to come down for, you put that in my schedule now, you know? So, yeah, because independent artists, we're not going to get that commercial radio unless we have budgets to hire a radio jobber. And those budgets are so huge. I think I'm going to continue paying my house note before I <laughs> go out on the limb and pay <laughs> that much money. I, you know, so, and honestly, I don't know really what I'll be, especially because my music is more throwback style. I don't know if the listenership on a so-called hip hop commercial station would really understand what I'm doing. So I feel like even if I did spend all the money to get it pushed out to commercial radio, I don't know if it would really make any sense. Right. Right. What are some of the things that you do to promote your tours? I saw posted on Facebook and Twitter mm -hmm. and Instagram. You want to talk a little bit about how you get that word out? Sure, sure. I do a lot of it, like you're saying, with social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I usually, as soon as I have the name of the tour and the tour graphics together, even if all the dates aren't together, I start saying, hey, September of 2019, October 2019, Spaces and Places tour with, you know, Mr. P. Chill and blah, 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 just to kind of get it in people's heads that, hey, something's coming, something's coming. And at the same time, I also send out an email blast to everybody on my email list, letting them know what's going on. Then I kind of follow up with just every, probably every couple of weeks until I have everything secured. Then I start especially once I hit the road, like every day, it's like, hey, we're here tonight, we're here tonight, this is what's going on, yeah, watch stop for this. This gets to be almost like a flurry of stuff that I'm sending out and the people I'm touring with are doing the same thing on their social media. I used to think that, oh, social media, it's not going to equate people coming out to shows, but it's kind of changed in the last 10 years. You know, back in the day, you know, with MySpace, I was like, oh, that's cool, I'll tell people on MySpace what I'm doing, but it's all about handing flyers out and da da da, da. Well, it's kind of different now. The, you know, the social media is like the digital flyer, you know, is what it's kind of come down to. And are you doing any advertising on Facebook or Instagram? I do that from time to time. I probably will run a few things here and there while I'm out on the road. I didn't do a whole lot this run, though, actually, <laughs> come to think of it. Mm -hmm. But I have done some things like that before, especially if it's a show that looks like it's going to be a pretty good size one anyway, or the venue's larger, I want to reach a larger audience, I'll do that. Uh, I've also used my presence on Pandora Radio to put commercials where in each of the cities that I'll go into, there'll be a 10-second spot where it'll have me saying, hey, you know, whatever city it is, I'm going to be at blah, blah, blah venue on blah, blah, blah night. And they'll play for the 10 seconds prior to my song coming on. Right. So and that's a free service that Pandora artists that, you know, get their music on the Pandora can utilize. But it comes in really, really handy. Recently, I did an experiment with Blip Billboard. That's a, like a billboard app where you, they have all these digital billboards across the country mm. to advertise for, you know, tour dates. And I've used it to advertise for a new one of my new singles that came out a few months ago and it seemed to be working okay but there it's a little hit and miss i didn't use that one for this tour either i just felt like that might be putting good money after bad right now but that is something i'm exploring for the future though interesting and back to pandora when you're dealing with pandora are you specifically having the ads on when your song is going to play or are you selecting artists that are kind of in the same space They'll only do it when it's before your song. That's their kind of stipulation. So nice. it would come on right before my song was played, whatever it pops up in someone's station or whether it was to my station or whoever's. And I can also cater it so that based on the region. So I can be like, okay, what's in like a 200 mile square, you know, mile radius, let's say Portland, Oregon, this commercial will, will advertise for my show in that region, you know, and that way at least I'm reaching people 
who would matter and possibly would come out to the show. Whereas it's a, a static message and you know, reach everyone across the country and someone in like Connecticut could be like, Oh, that's great. You're in Portland, but uh, whatever, <laughs> you know, and anything with Spotify. Spotify is a little bit tougher. I do use the Spotify for artists portion of it. So I usually have set up playlists and things like that and specialized playlists for, for the fans and the followers and whatnot. But I don't know of any way to put a commercial on there. Mm-hmm. I do actually list my shows on Spotify, though. So, for instance, if someone's following me on Spotify, you know, they'll see my tour dates and I'll tell, it'll alert them when there's something in their area. And if you go to Spotify for artists, you can set all that up. If there's someone who has their music on Spotify, they just need to go ahead and claim their artist page and then they can uh, put their bio up on there. They can put some pictures and the header graphic and all that kind of stuff and add their show dates and things like that. So the people are, cause that's really honestly probably the largest digital music platform right now is Spotify. Mm-hmm. And so many people use it. So you want to make sure that when people are on there, you know, consuming your music, that at least they're getting information on where they can come out and see you and maybe learn more about you. And it's kind of a weird phenomenon. Once upon a time, it was almost a given that artists have a website. And it's an interesting thing that I've seen over the past. I don't know. I guess as as social media has become more and more important, there are artists, new artists that just don't even have a web presence other than their social media. Clearly, you're not one of those folks. So I would no, imagine no. that you're also <laughs> you're also collecting email addresses on your website. Yes, I'm collecting on my website, and I also at uh, going uh, circling back around to the merchandise thing. One thing that should be on everybody's merchandise tails and email list you can sign. Take them home, add them in there. I'm always trying to get email addresses because that's a more personal way of reaching out to someone. You know, it's social media. I feel like it's too many bots that could do this. And I mean, I guess there's bots that could send out emails and whatnot, but I feel like it's a little bit more personal and I prefer to be personal with my fans. So, Right. And do you have a newsletter you send out to kind of let them know what you got going on? I try to stay on top of it on a regular basis, but when I'm out on the road, a lot of times it, you know, I might go a few months without sending something out there. But uh, yeah, I try to send a newsletter out there every, at least every month or two, just kind of give them a heads up on what's coming down the pipe tour wise or new releases and things like that. So realistic expectations so for an artist who has not done a lot of shows or has not been on tour but is interested in doing so what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions biggest misconceptions is anything you've ever put into your mind about what you think touring is going to be like based on what you've seen on tv or in the movies put all that out of your head. There's nothing glamorous about touring, at least not on an independent level. There's not. You're going to be working really hard, really exhausted. You're going to be driving a whole hell of a lot. And if you really don't love what you're doing, you really don't love your music, that might be the breaking point for you. That might be where you decide that, hey, maybe I'm going to go in a different path in my life because that's just a whole lot of work. I feel like it wasn't worth it. Well, then maybe you don't love what you're doing enough to do that. You know, it's uh, misconceptions are you going to make a whole bunch of money. It took me years of touring where I was losing money every time before I finally started. I figured out the formula and started making a profit out there. And a lot of that wasn't even so much figuring out the formula. A lot of that was I finally made enough, you know, good contacts in other cities where I get paid decently. And so those good paying dates are what I anchor the tour with. And so I know that, okay, I'm going to get this much money guaranteed. Now I have a little bit more flexibility to these other places, you know? I go out there and do that. I used to tell artists all the time that would be going out on tour for the first time. And they'd be like, you know, what advice is that? I said, look, whatever you do, don't expect to make a bunch of money. Go out there and figure, let's say it costs you $500 to go on tour. You could spend, look at it this way. You could spend $500 advertised on the internet and not have any personal interactions with anyone. Or you spend $500 to go out for a week, hit about five, six cities, do these shows. And every night you're performing your art and you're also interacting with human beings face to face. Who will be your fans for life from that because they have that personal interaction with you. So even when you lose money on the road, you have to look at that as an investment in the future. And I would imagine that most artists are not going to be able to have a writer with luxurious demands. Shoot, man. I, I barely got a writer myself. <laughs> I, I, you know, my writer is, hey, just give me some room temperature water. I need water that's not cold so I don't lose my voice tonight. 
but that's about that's about this. Like anything else after that is bonus. If you know, it's like, hey, if you're a restaurant, I'd love it if you give me a meal. You know, give me a plate of food. We'll call that pretty good because uh, meals are like gold on the road, uh-huh. especially meals that aren't from a fast food establishment or a gas station. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are some unexpected expenses? Obviously, you got to get to the location, so you got gas, mm-hmm. and clearly, you hopefully you're going to stay somewhere, so you got a hotel. Right. Anything else that comes to mind that would maybe not be obvious? Not the obvious. I always make sure I have a couple hundred extra dollars to cover things like toll roads and toll bridges. The first time I ever toured from out here in California, the East Coast, I drove across Pennsylvania on the turnpike. And I was like, whoa, this shouldn't cost that much to drive down these roads. Hold on. (laughs) That caught me way off guard. So be prepared for that. In larger cities, you're probably going to have to pay to park at the venue or the parking garage close to the venue. Keep some extra dough on you for incidentals, like you might blow a tire. I've had to retire as a road. I had to put a battery in my car on the road. You might have to do some some work on your car out there. (laughs) You know, so Uh that happens. And, And the minute you hear something strange in your car, just check it out. It's better to get it done as soon as possible. You have less risk of losing, you know, missing any shows. So. Man, and so you stay on the road. How is it two thirds of the year? Is that the case? In an oral situation, yeah, it's two thirds of the year. The last two years, a little bit different. Like I said before, my mom passed in March, and leading up to that last couple of years, I've had to be home a little more to help care for her and, and whatnot. And then, of course, coming home, ironically enough, coming home from tour last March, or not March, last, uh, last fall in October. I uh, broke my foot and I was laid up for six or eight months with my right foot and a cast and all that shit. So I'm like, mm-hmm. couldn't drive a car anyway. So this year in, la- in 17 and 18 has been kind of the, uh, the different kind of year for me, but the exception of the rule. But yeah, usually two thirds of the year I'm on the road. I have a deal with my wife. She's like, stay out on the road, do whatever you're going to do. Be home in November and December if possible. Mm. Okay. Be home around the holidays. And I'm like, you know what? That's not a bad deal. That's not a bad deal at all. Because <laughs> honestly, in the wintertime, I prefer to travel when it's not winter because the, the roads are questionable, especially out here in California, getting over the Sierras and whatnot. Those are always closed. Winter storms come through. And I'm a stapler about my word. If I say I'm going to be somewhere, I'm going to be there. Since I became a solo artist in 2001, I've done, I think, well over eight or 900 tour days, probably more. And I can count on one hand how many I've missed because of circumstances out of my control. Wow. And I prefer to keep it that way. Even, you know, that's why I was like, oh, I may not be able to make that. I'm probably not going to, you know, set myself up for that commitment. I don't want to get a reputation from that guy that doesn't show up or doesn't, you know, it's like right. my word is my bond, you know. Right. And have you worked with third party uh, agents? Not a whole lot. I've I did a tour one time where another guy's booking agent booked a tour. I was a support. And uh, I got to say, that was kind of fun not being the guy figuring it all out, just going out and being the artist. But it's, I have a problem where you can ask anyone that knows I'm a control freak straight up. I'd like to mm. have my hands dirty in every piece of it, making sure everything goes according to plan. There was too many. With that tour, there was too many uh, like, oh yeah, just be here between this time and this time. Well, what time is sound check then? Is it six or is it eight? I mean, come on. I like things to be on a very set, rigorous schedule, almost like a job would be. You know, it is my job, so I need to make sure I'm treating this. Such. But on the other hand, it was nice to not have to do any of the bookings. Just be given a list of, hey, here's your venues, here's your shows. You know, here's how long your sets are each night opening for this guy over here. And I would probably do it again, but I don't know. I kind of like the planning part of it too. I always say that if it gets uh, to the point where uh, I'm too old to be out here performing or where nobody wants to see the uh, the 50, 60 something year old white dude trying to rap, maybe I'll just get into the uh, managing and booking agent side of things and help young artists, you know? really enjoy setting that kind of stuff up. Well, speaking of that, man, I have to give you some serious accolades and much respect for being really an ambassador of real hip hop for over two decades. I mean, that is impressive, you know, especially in this genre where people, at least the perception is that they kind of age out Mm -hmm. of being artists, which obviously is not a fair because it doesn't apply to any other genre idea. But a lot of people still have that. Oh, if you're not over, you know, if you're over 25 or 30, then then you're old in hip hop and you've been doing it keeping it moving for all these years. So I have to like give you mad props for that. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that, Israel. And coming from you, man, that means a lot, man. Cause I know your history in the game, man. You've been in it for as long as I've been in it, man. It's not longer. So 
Much props to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Speaking of hip hop, man, you have a classic and feel free to correct me if you would describe it differently. You have a very classic vibe. So when I hear your music, I think classic 80s golden era and early 90s. Do you feel that that's an accurate portrayal? You hit the nail right on the head with that. That's exactly how I tell people my music is when they ask because they don't know about it yet. Right. You've done a lot of performances and obviously a lot of collaborations with some classic artists. I remember when you did at least one, if not two, Spider D collabs. What are some of the other uh, collaborations you've done with classic MCs? Uh, so I've done actually my newest release, Scott, yeah, my fourth collaboration with Spider D. That's my dude right there. That guy is like family all day long. But I've also done some collaborations recently with Peso from the Fearless Four, and I did some uh, regional touring with that guy too. So Super dope MC, super cool dude. I worked with uh, mm -hmm. Percy P, two mechs from the Visionaries crew. I did some work with him. Of course. And uh, and those guys are just phenomenal MCs. And because my thing is, is a lot of times people are like, oh, you should do a song with so and so or so and so. They're hot right now. And it's like, hey, that's cool. They're hot right now. But mm -hmm. if I'm going to put the time and effort into a song, I'm going to get with the artists that. I really respect lyrically, or maybe I grew up like the Spider D and Peso. Mm -hmm. I grew up listening to their music. So to me, just working with those cats is an honor. You know, it'd be like a baseball player, you know, a pitcher getting to go out and, you know, pitch to Barry Bonds or something like that. that he grew up watching them play or something like that. Just getting to share your craft with other people who are just legends in the game, you know? And speaking of legends in the game, I would say, man, after two plus decades, you fit in that category. You're on your, what, 13th, 14th album? Finished my 14th album. That was uh, Funky Ankle Chill. That was last year. I've been just doing singles this year, so I put together an EP that actually comes out at the end of this tour out of the CDs that we sell on the road. So I'm not really considering that full-length album just because I haven't had as much time in the studio this year with you know, other life obligations. But I still like giving me music to the people at least once a year when possible. But yeah, I was 13 albums deep. And actually, I put my first music out with the group I used to be in. It came out in July of 92. I was actually still in high school. <laughs> we put out a cassette <laughs> single. Wow. And, and it's real. Listening to it today, God, it was awful. I shouldn't have put that out. But then again, the same note, you know, it's a starting point. We can all you can measure your progress by things like that, you know. That's right. And in regard to being an independent artist, has there ever been a time where you ventured into getting signed or maybe at least talked about it with a label? Yeah, back early on when I was still in the group that I was in back in the early to mid 90s, there was a dude who moved out to Sacramento from Atlanta that me and my uh, my buddy I rhymed with were doing some production work for. And he had something going on with Ichiban Records. That was the label that had MC Breed at the time and people mm -hmm. like that. He never released anything with them. I think he shelved his record or whatever, but they were Ichiban or a subsidiary Ichiban, not sure exactly what the label was, but they were looking for two white boys mm -hmm. to do Miami booty bass. Mm. And I call them bass junkies. <laughs> and my partner at the time is like, do this. Or, or they want to give us this money here. And I'm like, dude, that money sounds, you know, especially you, you know, 20 year old kid. I'm like, oh, that sounds really good. I mean, I could quit my fast food job. That sounds great. But I think we'll be done in two years. Our careers will be over and there'll be no, I couldn't live myself making some fake stuff. Not saying Miami booty base is fake, but I'm not Miami right. or my booty base. So therefore I would be right. fake doing that, you know? So uh -huh. I turned that one down. I'm like, nah, I can't quite do it. And every once in a while, as I get older, I'm like, eh, maybe I should have just took the money. <laughs> nah, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> You know, with my independent label that I ran through the 90s, I had distribution through Columbia via Black Market Records, the uh, Brother Lynch's label out of Sacramento. They signed us on for a couple of years uh -huh. to do distribution. And I learned a whole lot about how the, the record business game works from working with them. Uh -huh. But I prefer independent. I'm glad I stayed independent because nobody tells me what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do. I control the quality. I control, you know the content. I mean, I went to school to be a graphic designer, so just about every album cover you've seen, I designed that too. So awesome. it's like a work of art I'm trying to create, you know, as a whole from the music, because most of the beats I rap to, I make myself, probably 70% of them I make myself. Ah. So it's like, I put it together nice. almost like a sculpture would, you know, like I'm making this whole final thing out of it. Right. So 
What's your process? Are you using uh, actual hardware? Are you just on software? What are you doing to make uh, the music? Uh, a little bit of both. Software, I use an old version of Reason. Not that I'm really using too much from Reason. I use that to arrange samples in. I still sample off the vinyl. I run that in through Sonar. and I have my own studio here at the house. I have a, a mixing console board. Everyone's like, oh, why do you have that? You just do it in the computer. Of course, we're all recording on computers now, but... When I started recording back in the day, we had a reel-to-reel recording on the cassette four tracks. So I'm used to knobs and faders, so I'm just like, look, just let me have my knobs uh-huh. and faders. Don't talk smack about my board over here. <laughs> I got a nice little Mac D24 channel board. It, it works for me, but I still make beats on the MPC sometimes. I've got some various old-school drum machines. I have an old bass synthesizer and some keyboards and whatnot that I'll work with, and ultimately everything gets you know recorded into the computer now, because that's, the, that's how I record nowadays, but... Uh, yeah, I still use hardware. I feel more comfortable with hardware. And that's one of the reasons I like Reason, too. I don't know if you're familiar with the Reason software or not. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Oh, then you know about hitting the tab and moving wires. It's basically like you're using old console, mm-hmm. like old rack bound stuff. It's just on the computer. So to me, mm-hmm. when I first started experimenting with using a computer instead of just a bunch of drum machines and keyboards, I was able to wrap my head around that a little easier. So I'm like, oh, hey, it's just a visual of what I'm used to doing anyway. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know. Did you have a favorite, speaking of more vintage stuff, do you have a favorite piece of gear uh, over Man, the years? Man, I really, really, really liked over the years. I really liked the Emacs sampling keyboard back in the day. That one and the Insonics Mirage. I used to use those extensively. The uh, SP-202 sampler. Back in the day, we used to use, the, and this is the 80s now, we used to use the Mirage and I think we sampled into the Mirage and then we triggered it with the DMX. Old school MIDI and stuff, yeah. <laughs> Going back to, you know, yeah, what I was saying about how I found the Insomniac magazine, I found my Mirage in my mom's garage too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know if that thing would work anymore, but part of me wants to sell it and part of me is just like, I kind of just want to hang out in the wall in the studio as like, <laughs> you know, like a, a business would hang their first dollar. <laughs> but that's awfully big to be hanging there. And I right. take a lot of nuts and bolts. Right. I think it's heavier than shit. And, and, I, and I interrupted <laughs> you. You were going to tell me another piece of favorite gear. Oh, yeah. I, the uh, SP-202, when I went solo, I uh, picked up it's a Roland SP-202 sample. It's a real, uh-huh. real grainy analog sampler. Uh-huh. But uh, my first solo single that I recorded, I did the beat on there. Right. And uh, so that one's always kind of sentimental to me, you know? Right. And I know we all have one so what was that one piece of hardware that you always wanted but you never got and i still want it bro i still want it i'm gonna get one one day i just gotta get my money right i've always wanted the tr808 the original there you go you know orange and yellow tr808 uh-huh. drum machine uh-huh. the, just to have one i mean even if i never yeah. really used it for much right. i just, just right. to have it in the studio and Speaking of which, man, I'm sure you're aware of this. You see Egyptian Lover does that thing still, Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> that, that guy is on some inspirational stuff right there, man. That guy's crazy. Very nice, very nice. I'm with you on that one. That's my piece right there. I, when I was younger, I always had the little cousins, like the 505, the 707, but never the 808. Mm-hmm. Or the 909, for that matter. We just had to use samples right. of the SB-12, SB-1200. Yeah, I used to have a drum machine that had the 808 and the 909 kicks in it, but never was it. But it still wasn't the 808. I'm like, uh... Right. <laughs> of course. Of course. So, for the uninitiated, or maybe just for the younger hip-hop heads that want to learn from classic material, give them five albums that they should dig into All right. five records from the history of hip hop that they should know if they're a true hip hop aficionado. And this is also goes towards young artists. They're looking for something to inspire them from that era. Okay. I would start off with takes a nation of millions to hold us back. No doubt. Public enemy. Mm. That one's number one. Number two from a very similar era. I think a year later is the cactus album by third base. Okay. Such a use of samples in that was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Another great one is the score by the Fugees. That is probably sonically one of the greatest sounding albums I've ever heard. There you go. That's one of the few albums I can listen to from top to bottom and not skip any tracks. Mm. Two more. Let me think here. And narrowing it down something that, that there's so many great albums to five is rough, bro. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and I put you on the spot. It's off the top. So. No, it's all right. I would say Ice T's The Iceberg. That's another good okay. one. Okay, okay. Because the, the production on that was kind of amazing. God, who's the fifth one going to be? 
you got me over here. I'm in my studio right now. I'm like looking at my wax collection <laughs> on the wall. Like, all right, well, come on. Something's going to reach out and be like, oh yeah, that one. Duh. <laughs> Shit. We're just going to, we're going to take it just right back to the roots. Run DMC, the uh, tougher than leather. The one that runs house on it. I'm with you. I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, that one. All right. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on Run DMC. If you can't appreciate Run DMC for what they were for hip hop, then man, I don't know if, if you should be doing hip hop. <laughs> uh huh. I'm with you on that. I agree with that one, man. So, Mr. P. Chill, what is it that folks need to, other than seeing you on the road when you're hitting their town, Absolutely. what do they need to look out for right now from Mr. P. Chill? I've got an EP dropping uh, called The Five Spot that's going to drop uh, digitally on October 11th. Uh, it's got a, a real gritty, gritty, grimy joint I did with my dude, uh, Spider D. It's like sounds like we recorded on like old school mics and shit. I got my DJ, Mike Colossal, just tearing it up on there over this beat. It's just like we, we kind of did it kind of gritty sounding on purpose because I was, I was like, this is so old school feeling. I want it to feel like like how it was back in the day. So I kind of just purposely did it like that. Uh, but the first single from that is actually, or the first single, there's two singles that came out earlier this year, but the first next one off of that is uh, Freedom, and that comes out on the 27th of this month. That's the next music. Um, there's still, like I said, there's a, I have a whole catalog of stuff. It's on all, all digital platforms, you know, Spotify, Pandora. You go to my band camp and order, you know, physical merchandise, uh, vinyl records i still i, I did my uh, funky uncle chill album on on actual uh, vinyl lps with bonus tracks and whatnot so and and give everyone your handles on social media you betcha okay so on uh facebook it's uh mrp chill on instagram it's also mrp chill on twitter it's mrp chill 916 because Early on in my Twitter days, I lost my password to the mm. one for MRP Chill, so I just started the second one. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I was like, I found the password. I'm like, oh, I should go back. I'm like, oh no, I got too many followers over here. It's gonna keep them, keep my area code on there. And then, um, similar thing happened with YouTube. So, it's YouTube MRP Chill nine one six. Right, and your website. Oh yeah, uh, Mr. Peachill Music dot com. Mr. Peachill Music dot com. Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. You have been a wealth of information. But more importantly, I want to thank you for being so dedicated, not just to hip-hop music, but the culture of hip-hop. So a massive salute to you, sir. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate that. And a salute to you for what you've done with Insomniac over all these years. And uh, definitely, man, hit me up anytime, man. I'm always happy to chat. Thank you. Appreciate that. And have a wonderful tour, man. Hey, thanks, brother. I'll talk to you soon, Israel. Peace. All right. Peace.